I'm a little bit excited. I don't want to show off or brag a little at all, okay? But uh, I did it. I did it, guys. I, I reactivated my membership at the gym. I did it. Woo! Um, I did it, and I'm, uh, I'm two weeks strong, at least three days a week for two weeks strong. You can probably tell. I mean, I probably don't even have to tell you. You can be like, yeah, he's been working out. Uh, but, so, but seriously, like, I know that you can't tell. Um, I'm in my 40s. I'm 41 years old, and this is what I've learned looking at other people in their 40s. There's kind of a spectrum of what my options are, okay? There's, like, spectrum. This end is, like, I can't touch my toes. Can't do it. This end is um, Tom Brady, I guess, is on this end. And so I'm not going for Tom Brady, but I want to land somewhere in the middle, maybe a little south of middle. Like, I want to be able to touch my toes, and I want to be able to, like, get up off the couch without standing like my granddad. That's what, I, that's what I want to do. Those are my goals, and so I'm two weeks in, and I'm pretty strong. Now, we have been one of those families who has been keeping our membership active at the YMCA, but not attending, not going to work out. And by the way, that's a great business model that gyms have. <laughs> and, and, all, and most of you have experience helping to pay for a gym to keep it open. And so every month, my wife, she pays our bills, and Lindsay says, uh, Chris, you going to go uh, to the gym this month, or you think we should maybe freeze your membership out there? And I'm like, I'm very optimistic. You know, this is all year long. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm, I'm probably going to go. I'm, yeah, let's keep it up. I'm going to go um, tomorrow. That's, that's what I'm going to go. And then it'd be the end of the month again, and she's like, okay, so this is how it's gone for, it went that way for probably like nine months, okay, I'm, I'm going to be honest about it. So early summer, I finally just said, okay, there was a lot going on at the building, we were doing all this work here, I'm going to promise you, I was getting my physical workouts in here in this building, and I said, okay, go ahead and freeze it. But I went back in, I reactivated it, and I, I'm three weeks strong, and I'm feeling good about it, because here's the deal, I love when I have routine. You guys ever feel like your routine's just falling apart? And you're just like, I can't figure anything out. And so for me, routine involves, like, it's all a package deal, okay? And so, like, if I'm not, like, physically active and having, like, my head, when I, but when I am working out and doing, I mean, I'm going to eat better, I'm going to drink more water, I'm going to sleep better. All of my other disciplines start to lock into place, including spiritually. Like, it's interesting how God has allowed our physical body and our spiritual self to kind of overlap like that. And you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Remember that uh, Peloton you bought last Christmas? Remember that treadmill, you know, the thing that's still in the box in your garage and you haven't even like plugged it in yet? You remember that commitment you made? Like, I'm going to read more books this year. Like, it was New Year's, you remember? It was a resolution. I'm going to read more books. I'm going to stop this habit. I'm going to do this, whatever. And then, like, or, you, or you made a really spiritual decision. I've been, I've done this. You ever started in January? You're like, I'm going to read the whole Bible this year. This is the year. I'm going to read the whole Bible. Like, God was like, you know, you're not really a good Christian unless you can read the whole Bible in 365 days. If you don't knock it out in one year, you might as well not even try. So we try it, right? But then around like February, you're somewhere in Leviticus and you're like, oh my goodness, I just can't keep doing this. And then you stop completely. Are you with me on that? And, and there's a reason, and it's because we, we stink at self-discipline and self-control. We're, we're really bad at it. Or is it just me? Y'all with me? Yeah, we, we are terrible at it. And as true as it is for our calendar and our, our physical life, uh, it's true for our spiritual life. And the thing that happens with our physical life is often it takes a big traumatic instance. Like you have to have a heart attack before you're like, maybe I shouldn't eat at McDonald's every single day, right? We, we wait till there's this dramatic, traumatic incident before we make any changes. And we do the same thing with our spiritual life. There's a death in our family or we lose our job or we have some big breakup or um, you know, something. A lot, a, lot, a lot of it happens in a good way, and it's not bad that we turn our hearts to God at some point in our life. I'm glad that we feel that we need to do that, but a lot of us, like, when, once we get married and once we have kids, like, these huge, big changes in our life, we're like, oh, wow, I should probably focus on my spiritual life some. It doesn't have to be that way. We're starting this series today, and we're calling it Thrive, Own Your Growth, and uh, we have a new teaching series about every four to six weeks, and I think it's because we are like uh, spiritually ADD, and it's good for us, well, and I got to speak every week, and I like to switch it up so that I can mix it up, but this isn't just any series that we're going through today. This is actually going to highlight, it's going to be a deep dive, really, into one of our five core virtues, core values, core values, one of our five core values, and I'm not sure if you've noticed, if you look outside the, above the coffee bar, there's these five framed black signs with white letters, and there's, there's wooden frame around them. And these are our five core values. We value this. We value that. And one of our core values is this. Own your growth. Own your growth. The idea is pretty simple. God has done so much work 
He's laid the foundation for building a relationship with us. He came to earth as a human being. He gave us uh, all of the tools we need through things like history, prophets, stuff like that. He's given us the ability to care for people around us. He's allowed us to have his blessings here in this world. Even many of the answers to some of our hardest questions are available. Like he's made it present and obvious or at least searchable. The basic thing of being able to shine light in dark places, all of that has been given to us. Like, it's just, it's there. It's there for the taking. But, like, the hugest part of the puzzle, probably, for most of us, is that we have to choose what we're going to do with all that. we got to proactively make a decision to choose how we're going to live. We have to take the time to be kind and to be generous. We have to do the work to figure out the hard stuff, suffering, and pain, and brokenness. We have to use our hands and our feet to live out the calling that God has in this world for us. We have to turn to him with our sin and be like, I don't want this in my life anymore. We've got to repent. Like We have to do that hard work. The, the, the grace and the forgiveness is there. It's been given to us. It's, it's there. But this own your growth piece is like our part. The, the ancient, age-old dichotomy of Scripture is like grace versus works. Like there's a part you have to do. And a lot of denominations have split over like it's one or the other. Scripture is very clear. It's both. <laughs> it's both. There's a part that you play. And that's why it's one of our core values. Because too often I have said, and I've been in ministry for 22 years, working at different churches and doing all kinds of different ministry. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of meetings I've sat in with church leaders, elders, staff, planning for conferences, planning for camps, just trying, to, and we're asking questions like this. How do we make people get involved in small groups? How do we push people towards like owning their spiritual growth? How do we get people in this Bible reading plan? How are we going to get people to attend church on Sunday? How in the world are we going to get volunteers to serve in the nursery? Is it ever going to happen? Like, how are we going to do these things? And granted, I'm thankful. I've been the beneficiary of like great leaders who have said, listen, we need to preach good sermons. You know, we need to have good environments. We need to have a place that's conducive to service in the community. Like, it, it's important for church leaders to set like those environments for that stuff to happen. But my observation is if I'm going to grow spiritually, I have to own my growth. It's on me to say what I want to do with my time. How am I going to manage my calendar? How am I going to manage my, my wallet? How am I going to manage my attitude? my marriage, my integrity. These are the things that I'm responsible for. The buck stops here. And so I just want to ask you, this is just kind of a, a pre-question for the whole thing. Would you like to live the abundant, full life that God has created for you? Would you like that? Do you want that for yourself? Would you like to get rid of the addiction or the sin or manage the pain and suffering that's going on? And would you like that? Would you like to know more about God and what that means in your life? Like, you got questions? Would you like that? Would you like to see the blessings that come from living under God? Would you, would you like that? I don't want to oversimplify it because there's a lot of God work happening. He's doing a lot of work in your heart. His spirit's moving. But listen, this is something you got to do. You have to own your growth. No one else is going to step in and do that for you. No one can grab the little steering wheel. As Carrie Underwood said, Jesus, take the wheel. He's like, uh, no, I built the car. I want you to sit there and try to drive it, okay? Until you take your last breath, you're going to have to steer this car. You're going to have to decide where I'm going to go with my time, my resources, and my relationships. And so today as we get in this series, I want to make, your, your, make sure your heart hears something loud and clear. Because we're going to talk about a lot of own your growth, own your growth, own your growth, own your growth. And that can feel really heavily like pressure. Like, oh my goodness, I can't. I can't do it. Like, I've, I'm intimidated by this. I don't have the resource. I don't have the knowledge. I just stink at self-control. I can't do it. Or maybe you're like, I, I like things the way that they are. I really don't really want to change much about myself right now. And if that's you, I want you to know you're not alone. You're not alone for two reasons. One, you're surrounded by people who we all struggle with that. But two, you're not alone because you were never meant to own your growth alone. God came into this world to assist us through Jesus. He shows us the way. And then he puts us in community with each other. And he said, I want you to help one another own one another's growth. I want you to get in that today. And so today really uh, is a kickoff to this series. We're going to be in this for four weeks. And my hope is that this is a lot of times the way that I teach 
is like Bible study, and we'll get into a passage, and we'll break it down, and I'll show you some history and some background. This is not so much what that is. This is going to be more of a practical, like a workshop. Like this is what, if, if Venture Church says one of our core values is own your growth, then we need to do a good job of saying that and holding each other accountable for that and then giving us some resources, creating that, like I said, environment where that can happen. And so uh, what I hope will happen today is we're going to look at a story where Jesus challenges some dudes to do just that, own their growth. And then we're going to also take uh, a step out into the lobby, like you'll do it as you leave, and you'll have an opportunity to make some decisions, like where am I going to own this growth? Like how am I going to do this? And what are some steps that I can take? And all of it's optional because it's completely up to you. So, uh, you know, no matter where you're on your spiritual journey right now, like if you're like, uh, I just came for the first time today, like I don't even know how far I'm willing to go. And I want you to know, that's great. You have owned your growth by showing up. <laughs> you did it. You're ahead of the rest of us. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look in God's Word. We're going to look in the Bible. If you've got a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew, it's in the last third of our Bibles. If you don't have it, it'll be on the screen, or you can look it up on your phone. That's no problem. We always have free Bibles we give away in the lobby, too. There's like a, a wooden shelf right by the door as you exit. Please, you are not stealing if you take one of those Bibles. Take one. We want you to have one. Put your name in it. It's your Bible. Or you can always just borrow it for church if you want to. But uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew is one of the biographies of the life of Jesus. And uh, in chapter 4, he's kind of meeting some of his first key followers. And we're going to see what happens there. So chapter 4, starting at verse 18. Let me set the scene for you. This first sentence does. As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. You see it? It's a big, big, big lake. Okay? It says, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They're out in a boat. They're casting a net into the lake. For they were fishermen. And Jesus says from the shore, I imagine he yells it, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. Moving on, verse 21. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, same lake, same shoreline, different boat. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their leader, their father, Zebedee. Preparing their nets, Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. So what we see here in Matthew chapter 4 is a model of what it looks like for someone to own their growth. Now, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about Jesus' role in all of this, and we spend a lot of our time talking about Jesus' role in a lot of things. But what I want to show you is we see Jesus. He's standing there on the shore. He's come from the Father. The book of John says he's full of grace and truth. He is God in the flesh. That's who Jesus was. And his solution for the spiritual growth of these four men, Peter, Andrew, James, John, is an invitation into a relationship. That's his solution for their spiritual growth. He says, hey, Come follow me. These four men have been hearing the reputation about Jesus for a long time. In fact, Andrew, uh, we understand, had actually been checking him out for some time now. Andrew was a disciple of another guy. Maybe you heard of the, uh, John the Baptist. And uh, John, John the Baptist had been preaching in another area. He was proclaiming that the Messiah was on the way and it was going to be Jesus. He had revealed that it was Jesus by this time. And so Andrew had actually been down there listening to John the Baptist preach and understanding who Jesus was. But the other guys had heard because there was this milling of information happening because Jesus Jesus was going from place to place doing incredible things. And he's given these teachings, and people are like, wow, this guy's an incredible teacher. I want to learn from him. So it might seem kind of random that some dude yells at you at the beach, and you're in your boat, like, come follow me. And I'd be like, no, thank you, you creepy man walking on the beach. No, it wasn't that at all. They knew who Jesus was. What, they were, Is that the teacher? Is that the guy everybody's been talking? Andrew's like, yeah, that's, that's him. I've seen him before. Come follow me. And I want you to see the reaction of these fishermen, because this is the the short little workshop on what it means to own your growth. Listen, this is verse 20. Verse 20 says, this is Andrew and Peter. He called to them, at once they left their nets and followed him. Okay, so, you know, if you're a a realtor and you're in the coffee house and you got your laptop and you're about to make a sale, Jesus calls you, come follow me, and you left your laptop. (laughs) You're like, peace. You walked out. You're at work. You're making the widget, whatever widget you make. Boss said, I need 300 widgets today. You remember on Elf where he's making the Etch-a-Sketches? Remember that? That's a great scene. (laughs) And and Jesus says, come follow me. And you put the Etch-a-Sketch down. And you walk out of work. I don't want to miss this part. (laughs) 
Because we're like, yeah, 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 I've been fishing before. My, my son's a big time fisherman. He's a YouTuber. You should follow him. He's going to be famous. We're going to be rich. Um, but he loves fishing, but like he does it like for fun. And most of you, if you fish, you do it for fun. These, these guys make their living fishing and they leave their nets and they follow. Look at the second group of guys, James and John, verse 22. He calls them and immediately they left their boats and this other word digs a little bit and their father it was their dad's business and they followed him. You can see their story play out if you read through the rest of the gospels and, and uh, I think there's some challenge for them in that. I think they've got to figure out like how are we going to make it financially? How are we going to like all these questions? But what I want to focus on today, because we're going to get into that other stuff in the next few weeks. What I want to focus on today is the moment where they lay down their nets. What does it mean to own your growth? Many of you know Joe Cartwright. Anybody know Joe? Yeah, most of you know Joe. If you don't know Joe, uh, we just said goodbye to the Cartwright family a few weeks ago. Uh, Joe and Christy, their three kids, have been a major part of our church family for many years. And we just like prayed over them and sent them out into the world to plant a new church. That's what they're about to do. So they're going to spend a year uh, doing a residency with a church in, in Maryland. And then from there, they're going to plant a church somewhere, maybe in eastern North Carolina. That's kind of what they're thinking. And so that's a whole other story. Most of you have heard parts of it. So, but Joe, Joe, Joe wasn't always uh, planting new church uh, when, when I first met him. I, I first met, and let me say this about Joe too, because those of you who don't know him, I want you to know, he, he was a leader at our church. He was one of our deacons. Uh, he actually was over, over all of our small group programming for the last year or so. Uh, he has served most of us in some way or another, if not just through prayer, but he's probably come to your house, him or his wife, to take care of you in some way. Like they were like salt of the earth, fruitful Christian people. Like these are good things. Um, but the first time I met Joe, I think he was about 12 years old. And uh, he was just his hood rat in Norfolk, Virginia. And I, I say that with all the love in my heart. My man, uh, he was tied up in the Bloods gang through his school. It's a pretty rough situation for him. A lot of violence and drugs and mostly posturing because they're middle schoolers. But there's these older high schoolers and then adults ahead of them. And it's like there was a lot of pressure to do certain things and act a certain way. But his parents made him come to church where I happened to be the youth minister. And so I'd come, see him come in, and Joe wasn't, um, he wasn't in a boat, but he was in a really baggy pair of jeans and a long white t-shirt. And that's when I met Joe. And uh, I knew that he hated coming to church with his parents. It was boring. He didn't like it. But I did know that he was interested in playing drums. And I'm a musician. I know a little bit about playing drums. And so I said to Joe one day after church, I said, hey, man, I see you looking at the drums. He had walked up on stage. He was like, ting, 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 you know. You want to learn? I said, you know how to play? Nah, nah. You want to learn how to play? Yeah. Tell you what, I'll, I'll teach you. He's like, what? Yeah, I'll teach you. Let, let's make a deal. How about I just, I'll come pick you up for youth group, and then you hang out with us for youth group, and then I'll show you some drums, either before or after youth group. And Joe's like, all right. <laughs> Sounds like a good deal. So I started doing that. I started picking him up, bringing him to church. And in time, I'll tell you, Joe didn't exactly uh, drop his nets that day, um, he barely picked up his pants that day, but he, he was interested. I got a little theory about discipleship. What does it mean to show someone Jesus? My little theory is this, that to, to make a disciple is simply to show someone else your corner of the kingdom of God. That's what it is. Invite them in. So if you're a janitor and, you, and you, you're janitoring for Jesus and you bring somebody else in, hey, let me show you how I work. And you... And, you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to even know who Augustine was. If you don't know who that was, don't worry. You don't have to know who that was. But yeah, I live for Jesus, and I do it while I do this. So showing someone else your corner of the kingdom of heaven, that's what discipleship is. That's, that's what we did. So we, like, we played some music. We listened to some Christian rock, rock and some Christian rap, and we talked about life. And I told him the story of the Bible uh, one day in the park. I was just sitting there, and I was like, so what, do you know much about the Bible? He's like, not really. So I had a sheet of paper, and I kind of drew a little uh, timeline. It started with Adam and Eve and got all the way to Jesus. And you like, still good? He's like, fascinated by it. He's like, this is everything. Wow, this is the story of the Bible. Yeah, it's all in there. And then I invited him to turn his life over to Jesus. Uh, the Apostle Paul is teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, and he says this. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I've learned this over and over and over again in my life, and that is that I don't have it all figured out. <laughs> I'm not perfect. I'm broken. I've got my own mess. But the goal is not to be perfect. The goal is to follow Jesus. And so as you invite people into your corner of the kingdom, no matter how dusty and cobwebby it might be, you can invite people the same way Paul did. If 
Follow me as I follow Christ. The way I followed Christ was playing drums and guitar and listening to music and playing a whole lot of ultimate frisbee. I mean, so much ultimate frisbee with teenagers. And that's the way that Joe was introduced to the kingdom of God. But then he made a decision. And he decided to drop his nets. And, and, and with that dropping of the nets, what are, you, what are you, 12 or 13 years old? What kind of nets are you even carrying around? It, for him, it was like how he carried himself, how he presented himself to the world, how he spoke the words that came out of his mouth. He had a lot of girlfriends and stuff, and he learned that the stuff that was happening was immoral and against God. And he was like, wow, I need to stop all of that. And he put himself into more community. It was not just me. I mean, we had a great group of men at our church who poured into him and other students who poured into him. And this is a teenager. A lot of you have a similar story, and for you it might have been when you were 19 or when you were 25 or when you were 46 or when you were 64. But along the way, somewhere, someone comes to you and said, hey, come follow me. Or as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And the question is, what net will you put down? And what is different after that moment for you? How are you going to be different in this world? Um, you had a little sheet of paper in your chairs around you. I want to encourage you to grab that. There's, there's plenty based on what I'm looking at here. There's enough for all of you to take home for. Uh, but if you'll grab it, it's a little survey. Um, and let me tell you about this survey. Uh, this is a no pressure survey. Uh, and we might actually offer this again next week um, when a lot of our people are back from traveling. But uh, it's a survey and it's going to serve two purposes. Number one, it's just going to challenge you to think through a couple of questions while I talk. Number two, if you're willing, though this is totally optional, I would love for you to fill it out and drop it in the bucket as you leave the room today because it's going to give us a little bit of a, a, a heartbeat on where our church family is on, on discipleship. Like, how are we doing? How are you doing? So this isn't a grade, like you're not going to get a report card. Your mom's not going to have to sign anything and bring it back. You don't even have to put your name on it. It's totally optional. I think I wrote the word optional twice on this thing. Um, but as you fill it out, and you, you, at the bottom, you might even see there's an opportunity for you to write your name and a contact thing. Because if you do want someone to talk, reach out to you, I want to offer that. Um, so take your time filling out. Don't, don't miss the next section, but I'm going to go through these questions. The first question is simply this. Are you in a discipling relationship. So I'm talking about a regular and intentional time with someone else that you have like communicated with them. Like, I want to grow my faith and I want you to help me do that. Are you in a discipling relationship? And there's some other things there that you can jot down what your answer is if you'd like to. Um, to get to that understanding, I want to talk about what it means to be a disciple. What is a disciple? What is a disciple? And so I'm going to kind of look at two sides of the same coin with us today. Uh, in English, we speak English. Anybody English speaker in here? Good. Hopefully you're, you're understanding what I'm saying. That's all I speak. Uh, the English word for disciple most literally means a learner. So if you're a disciple, you're a learner. Uh, the word disciple in English comes from the same root word that we get discipline from. And so there's something to that. When you think discipline, you might think like your mom and dad would like a paddle or a belt or sitting in a corner or having something taken away from you. That's part of it. But really, it's the goal of discipline is learning. And so it's like training with the goal of learning. So if you've had a, a football coach or a baseball coach or a teacher who came alongside you and said, listen, do these exercises, do these drills, do these questions, whatever. Like you're learning. So discipline, disciple, learner. Sometimes there's instruction. Sometimes it takes practice. Sometimes you have to fall flat on your face a few times to learn some things. That's like, apparently God has allowed me to have that the most effective way for me to learn. I need you to fall on your face. And I'm like, okay, don't, don't trip on that anymore. Learning is a very Western thing. If your concept, with, if you're familiar with the concept of like Eastern thinking and Western thinking, somewhere around Middle East of the globe, there's Eastern thinking, and then everything west of that is like Greek thinking. And the Greeks were philosophers. And you know what they valued? Learning and knowledge. And so to the point that in the modern church, we believe, I think a lot of people really believe that the most important thing you can do in your faith is to learn more stuff. Learn, 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 learn. Did a, get a degree, take another class, read another book, fill out another notebook, get blanks to fill in, make sure you listen to more sermons, watch more podcasts, listen to more podcasts, watch more YouTube videos, learn, 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 learn. Now, now, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's really, 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 really good. But that's just one side of the coin for discipleship, learning. The thing is, though, it's not really about how much you know. It's really about who you know. That's the point of discipleship. So let me flip the coin on the other side. Jesus grew up in a Hebrew culture. And the Hebrew word for disciple means follower. Follower. So another way of looking at disciple is a follower. So uh, in their setting, Jesus' setting, there was basically a dynamic relationship between a student called the Talmud 
and a teacher called the rabbi. The rabbi and the Talmud. And that was like a symbiotic relationship. And so the teacher, the rabbi, would come into someone's life. This is exactly what we're seeing when Jesus calls to the guys in the boat. This is a very intentional cultural moment for them. And he says to them, come follow me. And you have to be like invited by the teacher. You could go and ask if you could follow. But you have to like get in. In this culture, it was a big part of the story of whether or not a rabbi would even accept you. And these guys probably obviously had not been invited by a rabbi to learn, and so that's why they're following their family trade. In fact, most people would fall into the family trade. So for Jesus to say, come and follow me, these guys are like, what? I thought you would never ask. This is incredible. I got invited by the rabbi to follow. And, and the thing with the following, it's not about book learning and tests and knowing more stuff. It was actually about knowing your rabbi. I don't want to know what the rabbi knows. I want to do what the rabbi would do. Do you remember the what would Jesus do bracelets? Oddly enough, that is a very good description of what the goal of being a a disciple is. What would Jesus do? So they followed him around. We know from scripture that these guys ended up following Jesus around for like three and a half years. And so they see Jesus at his greatest days. We see him celebrating at a wedding. We see him crying at a funeral. We see him being, you know, uh, pushed on and shoved around by other leaders. And how did Jesus deal with that? And how did Jesus deal with things when he was tired and cranky and hungry? How did Jesus deal with that? And when thing after thing after thing after thing happens, his Talmud look at their rabbi and go, oh, okay, that's not how I would have done that. Okay, okay. So that's how we should do that. Okay. And he would challenge them. He said, what, what do you think about this? And they said, I don't know. And he'd tell them some story, a parable. And then in that, they would get to see the perspective of the rabbi. And so what is a disciple? A disciple is a learner. A disciple is a follower. And really, I think we are all disciples of something. In America, we don't really have the rabbi Talmud system. Uh, we have a system for Christians, at least, where we have the congregation and primary teacher. That's kind of our system. And I want to tell you that it's, it's, it's a good system. I've certainly learned a lot from listening to like preachers. Um, but that's not exactly discipleship. There's a lot of learning there. A lot of information being disseminated here. Discipleship is about a relationship. Someone that I can follow. See how they would react if they were in a similar situation as I am. Someone I could call. If I got a big question, and yeah, a lot of you guys call me, but the the reality is uh, there are so many people within this church family and our community outside of me as your pastor that could be a rabbi in your life. And so this first question, can you point to a discipling relationship in your life, kind of comes to to this question, like, can you point to a rabbi in your life? Is there someone in your life, as a young Christian, I met a guy named Will Boykin. I've talked about him several times throughout the years, and he was like, as I look back, other than my parents, who were fantastic leaders of me, they were the first person, pe- person that wasn't my, my parent, Will, who was like a rabbi to me. And I was a teenager, and I, I think he was in his late 20s, early 30s, and he did the craziest thing. He would invite me and a couple of my high school buddies over to his house on Friday nights, and we would work out in his garage on weights, and he would feed us pizza, and we would watch a movie, and that was our Friday night. I found out a decade or more later that he was like, you know why I did that? I was trying to keep you guys out of trouble. <laughs> I was trying to give you something to do on a Friday night. And while we're out there, we're lifting weights, and he's showing us technique, and he's doing all this stuff. But then he's like, hey, so how's it going to school? Oh, you got this girlfriend? Cool. How's that going? Yeah, yeah. Uh, d- does she love God? Is she, is she serving Jesus? Or Oh, she's not? Okay, cool. I mean, do you, how do you think that affects your spiritual life? I mean, he's just asking these questions. We trust him because we're at his house, and he's giving us pizza. And we're just listening to, and he's showing us. He's like, you know, I... I Here's a thought. Maybe that's not good for your spiritual health. <laughs> and he'd ask us all kind of questions. We would get to a place where he's like, uh, you guys want to study the Bible? Sure. Yeah, you're cool. Let's study the Bible. <laughs> we'd study the Bible. And we'd go through some stuff and he'd feed us our pizza and we'd, we'd leave. And that began to shape me. That's a rabbi I can point to in my life. That in a season, I really needed that. But I can look to a lot of other rabbis throughout my life. When I moved up in the southeastern Virginia, there was a guy named David McCants. And he was just a guy that I could call. And I was like, man, I was in youth ministry. He was older than me in youth ministry. And I don't think he realizes the benefit I had just going to McDonald's with him a few times, going to sit in his office and asking him questions. And moving forward, I think of a guy named Dave Milam, who really got me plugged in with the concept of church planting. I went and lived in Concord for a whole year to learn from him. Another guy named Vince Antonucci. Uh, You ever heard the phrase church for people who don't like church? He made that up. (laughs) 
A lot of the stuff that Venture was in our early years was because of the influence of events in my life. And there's people in my life today. So can you point to someone in your life that's a rabbi for you, who is showing you their corner of the kingdom, and you get to ask them questions, and they kind of put your feet to the fire a little bit every now and then? Maybe for you it's not a rabbi, because that's kind of difficult sometimes, especially in our culture. Is there a group of people that you can look to? For me, I've got several groups of people. I can think of three. Um, and they're from different phases of my life. One group of five of us that have been friends since college, and we really are on top of each other. Another one that I can look at, uh, that's my micro group of, of two other guys from Venture Church, and we, we've been together for, I don't know, seven, eight, nine maybe years, uh, holding each other accountable. And then there's another group of guys that I've more recently gotten plugged in with, and they're all church planters. Notice the people that are your discipleship relationship don't have to go to church with you. <laughs> they just have to be serving the same Jesus with you. And so those are guys that we, for different seasons of my life, these guys have been really impactful for you. So are, are there people in your life, groups of people? Maybe you've benefited from being part of a small group. I'm really pumped right now. We're, gonna, we're really in a process of rebooting what we're just calling like a, a pathway to discipleship at our church. Like that's one of our biggest initiatives right now and going into the new year next year is like, what does it mean for our people to be strong in their faith and be people who can invite other people into their faith? Not church attenders, seat sitters, you know, but like real active powers for Jesus in the community because of the relationships they have. And so small groups is something that we've got uh, four or five of them that are active right now. Some are all women. There's one that's all men. There's one that's uh, mixed uh, gender and have kids, one without kids maybe. And so uh, after service today, there's going to be a few people standing. There's a big wall out there that says own your growth. I don't know if you noticed it. That's a new graphic that got applied for this service. We planned it so it would be there for this. Um, go hang out with somebody by that wall and just ask them about small groups. Stephanie's here. I think next week Susan's going to be. Stephanie led worship up here earlier. Uh, Susan will be out there with her. And then maybe there's a smaller group that you'd like to be part of. We have something we call micro groups. A small group might be a group of like eight to 12 people that you can plug in with and grow. A micro group is like three to four people, maybe five. And the purpose of the micro group is the same. And we've got some like probing questions and some guides that someone can give you out there at the own your growth table over there and hand you something and maybe you can take that home maybe you want to be part of a class setting one of our elders james teaches a class every sunday morning at nine o'clock and they just do bible study basically right they crack open the bible they read until they run out of time study it talk about it pick it up there next week there's lots of good options within our church family but the question is will you own your growth will you step into those relationships or will it be good enough for you just to kind of mosey into church every now and then and check that off of your to-do list because that is not what God called us to. God called us to transformation. Sometimes when I go to the gym, uh, I have a plan. And so I got a plan I'm working through right now, and it's like, uh, you know, today is like triceps and, and chest day, right? Now, government, I got a list. I, I write it down. Like, I have it on my phone sometimes, but like, I get, I like to write it down on a piece of paper. Uh, and uh, probably because I'm closer to the age of the people who aren't sure we can touch our feet. And so I, I write that down because I want to check it out. I want to have a plan. And if I have a, if I have a plan, I know I'm going to do this exercise this many times, this exercise. This, and when I have the plan, I'm on it. And what's funny is like I get to the point where like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I'm like, there's more stuff on my list. And I'll just force myself to do it normally. Okay. There's another way I've gone to work out, though. Maybe you can relate to this. I walk in with no plan. And I put my headphones in. Looking good, though, man. I got the basketball shorts on, T-shirt, hat on backwards. Like, yeah, yeah. And I got to kind of like check out all the equipment. I'm like, yeah, still here. Yeah, the thing moves. Cool, cool. And I might go get on a treadmill and just be like, Tenth of a mile. That's good. Watch a little bit of like the view or something, whatever's on the little TV screen. I can't figure those things out. And you go, and I got and I just kind of meddle around. And like I might lift a few weights, a couple of these, a couple of those, and in between I'm just stretching, you know, drinking water. I'm like, well, that's an hour. And walk out. There is value in that, right? I stretch some, I maybe spoke to some people. There's va- it's not that there's no value in that. But the cumulative difference over having a plan versus going in with absolutely no plan, you guys know the difference. It's incredible. Tom Brady's got a plan. I'm going to tell you that. There's a plan. And the same thing is true in our spiritual life. Because I think we are often guilty, and I am chief of sinners in this sometimes, that we just mosey in the church with our headphones on. We're like, yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hi. Oh, got some good activities coming on. Put it on my calendar. Do some things. Do some things. And we plug in. But the whole idea is just to kind of be present, but not to have a plan. Not to own my part of the, the growth. 
to put myself in the vulnerable situation of going to a men's retreat. I love our men's retreats. We just had one last week, and it was incredible. And I know, I know, guys, some of you, you're like, there's going to be a moment where somebody's going to feel like we need to talk about personal stuff, and I'm just not feeling that. You know what? You don't have to. But I can tell you, when I've done it, it's just like, oh, my goodness. And I'm not alone. And these dudes care for me. We prayed over some men last weekend, and it made a difference in their life. It's incredible. We prayed over some stuff in, in Willie's life that I believe miraculously happened. And Willie will testify to that. You can ask him. He likes to talk about it. But you've got to own your growth. So as we wrap up today, I just want to leave us with a challenge. I told you this is just workshop style. Think about it. Take a home and chew on it. The challenge is this. It's two-part. Number one, this week, decide what net do I need to lay down to follow Jesus. Does that mean I need to quit my job? I'm going to be real with you. Some of you might need to quit your job. Uh, All the time, Jesus called people to do that. All the time. Like, find me a place where someone didn't quit their job to follow Jesus, and they're the minority. (laughs) Am I saying you need to quit your job? Probably not. Probably not. But I got a feeling something with your occupation, it, it, it holds such a sway on you that it is your Lord. And maybe you need to lay down a big part of that. And I can't tell you all the things you need to lay down. Maybe for you, it's like, I'm so strapped financially. Okay, well, what if you made a ton of changes? I just got rid of a bunch of junk. Because what if your priority was to follow Jesus? What net will you lay down? I want to challenge you to write that down. Not now, now if you know, but take some time this way. What net? Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a fear. Maybe it's a conversation you'd have. The second half of this challenge is this. Commit to plugging yourself into a discipling relationship. That's it, but there's more to that. I'll read it. Commit to plugging yourself into a discipling relationship with someone by reaching out to them or making an effort to discover how you can do that. You might want to take a picture of this one. It's a lot of words, but the whole thing is own your growth. We, we can't be relying on someone else to service on a silver platter our own spiritual path. We can't do that. It does not work. No religion, no worldview can offer that. You have to decide, who do I want to be? Who do I want to live for? And what steps do I need to take in my life to do that? That's what it looks like to own your growth. So decide which net you're going to lay down and then decide what you're going to pick up. Decide who's going to guide you. The whole point of this message is that you don't have to do it alone. You do not have to do it alone alone. Venture church, let's own our growth. But no one should venture alone. Let's pray.